They're already traumatized by almost a week of round-the-clock bombardment. Now there's panic and confusion in northern Gaza after Israel's order to move south ahead of an expected ground offensive. More than half of Gaza's population live in the area north of the Gaza River that's been told to evacuate. Israel has sealed off the strip and repeated airstrikes have forced the southern exit into Egypt, the so-called Rafah crossing, to stop operating. At least 423,000 Gazans had already been displaced by those airstrikes, which the health ministry says have now killed around 1,800 Palestinians, many of them children. Hamas, which is designated a terrorist group by the UK, says 13 of its hostages were killed in the last day of strikes. The number of people killed in Israel since Hamas launched its brutal attack has passed 1,300, most of them civilians too. The group continues to fire barrages of rockets at Israel. Some hit Ashkelon and Zderot. Others were launched at northern Israel. And in the West Bank, Israeli forces have killed nine Palestinians after clashes broke out as people marched in solidarity with Gaza. 44 people have been killed there since Saturday. That's according to the Palestinian Authority. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Porik O'Brien, has the latest developments and a warning. You may find his report upsetting. Brief, surreal respite from the roar of airstrikes in the skies over Gaza today. The Israeli army dropped thousands of leaflets over the north of the Strip. The chilling public service announcement read as follows. To Gaza residents, terrorist organizations launched a war against the state of Israel. Gaza City has turned into a battlefield. You have to leave your homes immediately and head south of Wadi Gaza. For your safety, don't return to your homes until further notice from the Israel Defense Forces. Leave all public and known shelters in the city of Gaza. And with that, people grabbed what they could, like Abu Abdullah and his sons. What's happening, he's asked. Expulsion, he exclaims. Leaflets drop from the sky telling us to leave. That's it. So we're leaving. The Israeli army told the UN that 1.1 million people living in the designated zone had 24 hours to leave. It was not clear when the 24-hour period started or when it would be up. Generations of refugees displaced again. It happened to our grandfathers, this man says. It's happening to us now. It's happening all over again, being forced out. This morning, an admiral in the Israeli army acknowledged the difficulty of that number of people fleeing in just a day. He also said that Hamas had set up roadblocks preventing people from leaving. We've been told about police checkpoints in the area, but we have not seen visual evidence of Hamas physically turning people back. We've been trying to contact people in the north of Gaza all day. It's been difficult to get through because the internet is down. We finally did connect over the phone with Musab Abu Toha. He's a well-known author and poet living in the evacuation zone. Himself and his wife and children, along with four other families, left their home yesterday. But could only find accommodation a few miles south in a relative's house in the Jabalia camp in Gaza City. Five families are now living in a two-bedroom apartment. They arrived at 4 p.m. yesterday. Four hours later, this happened. And at 8 p.m., the Israelis targeted a house that is just very, very, very close to us. It's just five, five meters away from where we are staying right now. And it was a massacre. They said about 20 people from the same family. I had a chance to leave the house after I heard the screaming of people, there were people injured in the streets. I saw with my two eyes that a mother and her daughter were dangling from the floor because there was no wound. So I saw the two bodies just dangling from the floor. They were about to fall. The Israeli army said today they've already carried out localized raids in Gaza, but the order to leave is the likely preamble to an all-out ground offensive. Street-by-street -street battles between Hamas militants and the IDF, with civilians unable or unwilling to leave in the middle. The UN said the evacuation order today 
will have devastating humanitarian consequences. The United Nations considers it impossible for such a move to take place without devastating humanitarian consequences. The United Nations strongly appeals for any such order to be rescinded, avoiding what could transform what is already a tragedy into a calamitous situation. According to Gaza's health ministry, the number of dead since the bombardment began is approaching 2,000. If you're one of those unable to leave on time, you're now praying that the clock will stop ticking. Warwick O'Brien reporting. Well, in the last hour, we've heard that infantry and tank units have taken part in raids into Gaza. Well, our foreign affairs correspondent, Sekunda Kamani, is with me now. Sekunda, it's good to see you here in Jerusalem. Um, is this it then? Have they started? Well, look, information just emerging about what the Israeli army is calling a series of localised raids by soldiers and tanks into the Gaza Strip aimed at helping locate the hostages, the more than 100 uh, Israeli hostages that have been taken by Hamas into the Gaza Strip. So this doesn't seem like it's the, the start mm. necessarily or the very absolute beginning of, of this ground offensive, though that could well be imminent because uh, we've been hearing this very controversial, much criticised order from the Israelis for everyone in the north of the Gaza Strip to evacuate down to the south. So it does seem that it's about to happen. But, the, you know, coming back to this issue of Israeli hostages, that mm. we know is a real priority for them. Um, we've seen as well, just in the in the last few minutes, Hamas release a, yeah. a video in which you see their armed fighters with Israeli soldiers with Israeli babies. Now, presumably, they're doing that because they want to show that these children are being looked after, but really, that's a, it's a very, very chilling video. And just briefly, uh, you talked to Israeli troops yesterday. What's their morale like? Because this could be a big trap for them as well, couldn't it? Well, certainly, there's likely to be Israeli military deaths in, in the Gaza Strip. Many, many, of course, more uh, Palestinian deaths will be caused. Uh, but the mood amongst the Israeli troops, it seems very gung-ho. I mean, they, they are really, it seems, motivated by a desire for revenge. They mm. probably wouldn't categorise it like sure. that, but there's been this sense of collective trauma about this attack and the, the nature of this attack in Israel, and that's leading for mm. this desire for revenge. And that's, of course, leading to this, these awful scenes that we're seeing play out in Gaza. Sikandar, thanks very much, and thanks for all your amazing reports. Thank you. Well, earlier I spoke to a doctor who's moved four times this week in an attempt to stay safe, to stay alive, but has remained in Gaza City in the north of the Strip. Dr. Kamis Alessi is a neurorehabilitation and pain medicine consultant. I asked him why he hadn't evacuated to the south. I can't go because there are thousands of people who are trying to flee. And not only that, uh, there is no place for them to go because... You go to, to Khan Yunis, you go to Middle Zone, you will find chilling and killing. So you will rush back to your home and you say, I would rather die in your home rather than to die in a place in the street. Because there is no place safe in Gaza. No place is safe now in Gaza. So just to be clear, you are not going to evacuate and there are thousands of people around you, you're telling me, who are either unable to evacuate or don't want to yeah, evacuate. Yeah, no, no, because, because even, even we try to evacuate, uh, the, the police officers are blocking the roads, uh, so they said we don't want another Nakba, another transfer, and uh, cool. this is for some. Uh, so when I was thinking of, of going, they said uh, you cannot because the road is blocked, so I turned back and go back to my uh, third place of transfer because I've moved right. three places already. So it's, it's, it's sure. beyond imagination. So just to, be, just to be clear, the authorities and that by that I mean Hamas, are telling people they cannot leave the evacuation area because they want to avoid exactly. another transfer. In other words, the wholesale removal yes. of the people, like in 1948, with, their, with those yes. people, they're not allowed to return to their homes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, and is that yes. what they're telling you at the checkpoints? Yes, they're telling you, I mean, uh, you're, you're, we don't want you to move, this is... This is, will not happen and will not allow it to happen. And even if we wanted to go, we, we find no place because people, we found them coming from Khanunis to Gaza. They're running, running from Khanunis. So when we saw people running from Khanunis and Rafa, which is supposed to be the, the final destination, back to Gaza, and they're running for their life. What do you expect then from the next 24 or 48 hours? 
I expect more and more deaths to be recorded because every day we are adding 200s, 300s to the numbers of deaths. Just yesterday, we were recording 1,100. This afternoon, we have 1,300. Now we have 1,800. So, and if we, if we are allowed to get the dead from under the rubble, the kids who were buried under their homes, the numbers will exceed 2,500, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, the number will exceed 2,500 right now. So more and more will be killed. And for, for what? For what? Just to feed the arrogance of some leaders. So this is a final message. Okay. Maybe tomorrow you will not find me. I will be among the dead. But this is the message that I want to convey to you first and to every other man with a, with a living conscience in his heart and his mind to stop this ongoing onslaught and stop it now. Dr. Alessi, I hear what you're saying and the situation sounds terrible. And I'm very glad that you're telling us your story and describing the situation where you are because it needs to be heard. But can you just, in some detail, tell us what's going on in your hospital, the state of the patients, um, the difficulty of evacuating any patients under these circumstances? Just describe in that fact, to me, please. In fact, yesterday, yesterday I was a chief hospital, and yesterday they still have maybe some fuels for three days more. So in two days, the hospital will be shut down. In today, they have no more beds for patients, no more beds in the ICU. So patients are being seen on the stairs, in the streets, near the car parks, because they have no more beds. Patients are coming with in hundreds. Unfortunately, more and more patients coming with severe injuries, no more medicines, no more drugs, no more light, no more oxygen, no more ventilators for the ICU patient because no more electricity. So more and more patients will be dying indirectly because of this ongoing onslaught before the eyes and ears of the modern world, mm. unfortunately. All right, Dr. Kamis Alessi, thank you very much indeed for giving us that interview, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, thank you. Now, the US is working with aid agencies on setting up safe areas for civilians in Gaza. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on a seven-country Middle East tour, taking in Jordan, Qatar, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia today alone, as he tries to stop the conflict between Israel and Hamas spiralling into a bigger war. It already threatens to pull in Lebanon after Israel shelled the Lebanese army observation post at the border. The Reuters news agency says that one of its journalists was killed. Friday prayers in Jerusalem are never straightforward even in calmer times. But danger now hangs in the air, more than ever. As pungent as the tear gas used to attempt to defuse the situation. The region is now a powder keg, with civilian populations incandescent at the siege and bombardment of Gaza. Many of those in Jordan used to live in the neighboring West Bank, but authorities there were pushing protesters back from the border with tear gas, a sign of the tightrope that Israel's neighbors are now walking, how to express outrage without escalating the conflict. Israel has already clashed with its northern neighbors this week, and leaders of Lebanon's militant group Hezbollah welcomed their colleagues from Iran today. Together with Hamas, they form what Israel calls the new axis of evil. But preventing them from joining the conflict is now the major aim of diplomatic efforts across the world. The calls with us by great powers, Arab countries, envoys of the United Nations, asking us not to interfere in the battle will have no effect. Every time we ask them, why do you not stop the war, they tell us, do not intervene in the battle. Mr. Secretary, how are you? You are Western. Western officials, for their part, are now on the whirlwind tour of the region, desperate to put the brakes on an already spiraling situation. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with the King of Jordan and Mahmoud Abbas, the 87-year-old president of the Palestinian Authority, and whose influence on the conflict is more theory than practice. More promising, perhaps, may be tonight's talks with the Qataris, better place to broker between Hamas and Iran. 
I think Anthony Blinken is doing his best. I think the fact that he's already landed in Qatar and meeting uh, the Emir there is extremely significant. I think Qatar is a very wise choice given its links both with Israel and Hamas and in the region. Uh, it's, I think intensive, intensifying the diplomatic efforts ahead of any um, further inevitable escalation is um, absolutely key given that with escalation will be, the humanitarian situation will deteriorate rapidly. We're, we're with you, Mr. Prime Minister, and as, as the President said, uh, we have your back. And, uh... U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was in Tel Aviv to affirm the unequivocal support being given to Israel. No need for soft words when your arrival is preceded by the biggest aircraft carrier group in the U.S. now parked in the eastern Mediterranean. But this too is a tightrope with the UN warning that Israel's next action could turn a tragedy into a calamity. If the West becomes complicit, will anyone take their calls for restraint seriously? For any country, for any group, or anyone thinking about trying to take advantage of this atrocity, to try to widen the conflict or to spill more blood, we have just one word. Don't. One theory is that Hamas has laid a trap for Israel by luring it into the Gaza Strip with the viciousness of its attack a week ago. Israeli soldiers fighting at close quarters in streets turned into a warren of rubble. But it could also be a trap, or at least a moral maze, for Israel's backers wherever they are. Does unflinching support for the country that has suffered the worst loss of life since the Holocaust create a calamity for innocent Palestinian civilians? with consequences felt for years to come. Well, joining me now from Washington, D.C., is John Kirby, the White House National Security Spokesperson. Thank you so much for taking time to come on our program, Mr. Kirby. Um, we are all in united, I think, in shock at the appalling events of last Saturday. But would you agree with the United Nations that Israel's order for 1.1 million people to evacuate the north of the Gaza Strip in less than 24 hours is almost certain to lead to calamity. We're concerned about the fact that Hamas is throwing up roadblocks and not letting people and ordering them to stay in their homes. Now, I, I'll let the IDF speak for their evacuation order. It's a tall order to be sure to try to move that many people south in that kind of a time frame. I mean, that's uh, I, I think, you know, uh, they should be the ones to talk about uh, their desires to do that. I think we understand essentially uh, the goal behind this was to try to get civilians out of harm's way, and that's a commendable goal because it's Hamas that's putting them in harm's way, not only by sheltering in hospitals and schools and tunnels underneath their houses, but now telling them to stay home and putting up roadblocks in case they want to leave. Now, one of the reasons why they're putting up these roadblocks, apparently, is that they're worried that if people are going to leave the north of the Gaza Strip, they won't be allowed back. Uh, you know, it was going to be another 1948 when people were forced to leave areas in other parts of what is now Israel, and they weren't allowed to come back. They called that the big disaster, the Nakba. They don't want another one like that. Do you understand what they're trying to say here? No, I actually disagree 100 percent. The reason they don't want people to leave is because they want to use these innocent Palestinian civilians as human shields. Uh, that's, what they're, that's what they're trying to do. I think if you try to ascribe some sort of humanitarian purpose to Hamas, uh, that's a fool's errand. It's, it's more about the land that, they will, that they're afraid of you know, losing at the end of the day. And of course, you know, Palestinians know what they're talking about when it comes to that. But let me put it to you like this, or let me ask you this question. The, the key to all this might be Egypt. Egypt opening the Rafah Gate in the south of the Gaza Strip and allowing people to take shelter there if and when the situation gets even worse. The Egyptians have kept that gate closed. Are you trying to impress upon them that it should be open? Yes, we are, we are talking uh, very concertedly with uh, Israelis and with our Egyptian counterparts to see if we can provide some kind of safe passage out through Rafah so that those uh, citizens of Gaza that want to leave that they'll have the ability to do so safely and efficiently. We do not think that innocent civilians in, Palest in, in Palestinian Gaza uh, should have to suffer uh, the, any, mo any more than they already have by what Hamas is, the, the situation Hamas has put them in. Hmm. 
but but I mean they've suffered already in the in the you know thousands of bombardments um, from Israel in the last week in retaliation to the terrible attacks of Saturday. I wonder also what you make of reports that have now been verified um, by human rights groups that Israelis have used white phosphorus bombs in their attacks. We cannot confirm those reports. I've seen we've seen them, but we're not in a, we're not in a position to be able to confirm them. Uh, and are you telling the Israelis, uh, you know, to be cautious, to 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 rein in some of their attacks, to be cautious with civilians? Because so far we've seen very little evidence of that. Now the right number of civilian casualties is, is zero. Of course, we don't want to see any more civilian lives uh, cut short. Uh, uh, on, in Israel or in Gaza. That's, that's, what we, that's what obviously we desire. And we are having active and continued conversations with our Israeli counterparts about the law of war, the law of armed conflict, and respect for innocent human life. There have been many reports, I'm sure you've seen them as well, that actually the Egyptians were telling the Israelis and the Americans that they had intelligence of such an imminent attack from Hamas. Can you confirm that? I cannot. OK, let me try another one. Um, the, you know, it's been said by many people in this country that the attack of October the 7th was Israel's 9-11. Now, I think we can all agree that after 9-11, America made a few big mistakes in hindsight. Um, Iraq, Afghanistan, the quick withdrawal, etc. What are you telling Israel and when it comes to not repeating the mistakes that you made and that they should not make? I don't believe that the context and the contours of the conversations that we're having with Israel, and I'm not going to detail diplomatic conversations here, but the contours are not around uh, what happened in 2001 and 2002. It's around what's happening in 2023. And yes, it was on this, the, the, the suffering that Israeli has gone through is certainly equivalent to their version of a 9-11, but they get to talk about uh, what this means to them. They get to talk about uh, what they're going to do going forward. They get to make those decisions. The IDF is, and mm. I'm not going to speak for their military operations, and we're certainly not right. uh, you know, shaping our conversations with them about mistakes made 20, 23 years ago. Okay, but you also provide them the means with which to retaliate, the means with which to defend themselves. So are you telling them that if they go too far, if it's too excessive, they risk a much wider conflict in the Middle East. Now, I really do appreciate the effort to try to get me to detail our conversations with the Israelis, but I'm simply not going to do that. Uh, the president has had three conversations with Prime Minister Netanyahu. The Secretary of Defense is there today. Secretary of State was there yesterday. We're obviously in close touch with our Israeli partners. They have every right to defend themselves. They have every right to go after Hamas uh, and to try to eliminate that threat, that, that dastardly, brutal a depraved threat that they faced uh, last weekend. And as, as Secretary Austin said today, we stand with you. We're going to stay standing with you. We're going to make sure you have the tools and capabilities that you need uh, to, protect your, to protect your citizens. John Kirby, thank you very much for coming on the program. Now, many countries in the Middle East have urged Israel to hold off on plans for an all-out assault on northern Gaza, with roads turned to rubble by airstrikes and fuel running out. The UN says it's impossible to evacuate such a huge number of people in such a short space of time. And for people who are seriously ill or injured, it amounts to a death sentence. Paul McNamara looks at what such a massive evacuation means in a place like Gaza and how a ground invasion might unfold. Tanks and troops amassing in their thousands along the border with Gaza. Positions already dug in and firing. What's expected next? A vast escalation. Israel has called for everyone north of the wetland called Wadi Gaza, including Gaza City, to evacuate south. Some 1.1 million people. But it's not just homes that must be evacuated. This area contains at least 10 hospitals, three UN-run compounds and two refugee camps. From the top of Gaza to the Wadi, it's only about 10 miles, a four-hour walk on clear roads. But since Saturday, there have been more than 6,000 airstrikes across Gaza, leaving many roads unpassable. And if the deadline is to be met, since announcing it last night, 46 thousand people would have had to cross from north of Gaza to the south every single hour. What's going to happen is not yet wholly decided. 
um, the basic choice is, is whether you essentially have a raid where you go in, do what you can, and then get out again as quickly as possible, or you really attempt to change the political and military situation with, within Gaza, which will take a much longer time. Some 300,000 Israeli reservists have been activated alongside a standing force of more than 160,000, outnumbering Hamas's estimated 30,000 fighters. If a ground invasion ensues, the result is likely to be devastating, say strategists. If I was to um, characterize it as anything, it will be more like, it will be like Mosul or Raqqa in, in, in Iraq and, and, and Syria. Um, the Iraqi security forces with coalition air support um, had to go do block by block fighting to clear Daesh out of uh, out of out of um, Mosul, and Mosul was devastated as a result. And if Hamas intends to fight for every inch of the ground as Daesh did in Mosul, then that's probably what it's going to look like. Israel Defense Forces say they will do everything to try and minimize civilian casualties, but quote the sad reality. It's Hamas's responsibility. I think we can imagine it to look, unfortunately, incredibly brutal uh, with a, a really high civilian, uh, civilian casualty rate. They've now requested right, to, to leave that particular part of Gaza. They've requested them to leave and go to the south. You're talking about 1.1 million people or more uh, having to relocate uh, in the space of 24 hours. It's simply not possible. So unfortunately, I think there's going to be a very high casualty rate. With escalation comes yet more questions, like what does success eventually look like? But for tonight, for many, the only concern is how to get as far south as possible. Well, earlier I spoke to Lieutenant Masha Mickelson, who's a spokesperson for the Israeli Defense Forces. She's based in Tel Aviv, and just before the interview, she had to run and take shelter after sirens sounded in the city. I began by asking her about the IDF's order for more than one million people living in and around Gaza to evacuate and move south. There's been an uh, instruction by the IDF for the people in the northern part of the Gaza Strip to move south from the northern area of Gaza. We had no time indication on this morning. So are you still sticking to that timetable of 24 hours to get 1.1 million people we do not have a 24 hour timestamp on the evacuation. The IDF knows that evacuation takes time, that it takes longer for people to move. And we're considering that in our operational uh, assessments. Right. The United uh, Nations has warned that that kind of evacuation of so many people in such a short time frame could be calamitous. We are fighting war against the Hamas terrorist organization. What's calamitous is the murder of women and children, the decapitation of young women, the rape of women and parading them through the streets of Gaza, beheading women and babies, burning people alive in their cars. Hamas has caused the deadliest day in Israel's history. The most Jews killed in one day since any other single day from the end of the Holocaust. The IDF is focused right now on making sure that Hamas never has the ability to hurt Israel like they did on Saturday. Evacuating more than a million people, most of them civilians, from a tightly, uh, very congested urban area to another part of the Gaza Strip is going to be very hard to do. And I just wonder if that evacuation doesn't take place in 24 hours, would you still go ahead with your incursion, with your invasion? Gaza right now is a war zone. This is a fact. The IDF is using all possible channels, phone calls, uh, radio, internet, uh, flyers, to warn people to get away from the Hamas infrastructure and to get out of the zone of danger currently. We are fighting against Hamas and we are striking Hamas terrorist targets. The evacuation is a thing that takes time. We understand that and it is being taken into consideration. We are assessing the evacuation of the uh, civilians in Gaza, but what we are getting from the field is we have now intelligence of Hamas setting up roadblocks near the city of Gaza to prevent its own people from evacuating and getting out of harm's way because Hamas has always and will always use its citizens as 
human shields. They're cynically abusing the innocent people of Gaza and using them as human shields. When the IDF needs to get into an area or to strike an area, Hamas will not let the innocent people go because they know that makes things complicated and they, are, they do not care. There are thousands of injured people, again, most of them civilians, in the Gaza Strip right now, many of them languishing in hospitals where the power has been virtually cut off. Tens of thousands of people taking shelter in schools or anywhere else that is still safe. Those people may not be able to move. When there is a person sick in a bed, they are not a target. But when a school is used to launch rockets, it's not a school, it's a launching pad. When a mosque is used to store weapons, it's not a mosque, it's a weapon storage. So if there is an innocent civilian there, they're not the target. It doesn't sound like you're going to take a great deal of care to save civilian lives. That is absolutely untrue. The IDF cares about non-combatants who aren't involved in terrorism. And we are aware and have always been aware that Hamas is cynically abusing the IDF and Israel's care for human life to advance their own terrorist targets. I mean, can we expect the incursion to start in the next 24 or 48 hours? All military options have been presented to the security cabinet and political echelon. A ground operation is one of them. We will leave it to them to decide when the timing is right, but the IDF is prepared for any option that will be chosen. Okay, going to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Lieutenant Masha Mikkelsen. Thank you. From Baghdad and Tehran to Islamabad and Paris, protests have been held around the world, supporting Palestinians and condemning Israel for its airstrikes. Such protests have left Jewish communities fearing that they'll be targeted as anger grows over Israel's response to the unprecedented attacks on its people on Saturday. And a warning, there are some distressing images in Jane Deeds' report. Friday prayers in Baghdad. Tens of thousands took up a call from a former Hamas leader for Muslims to take to the streets in support of the Palestinian people. In Tahrir Square, Israeli flags marked with a red cross were set alight. We're demanding the victory of our people in Palestine, the end of the blockade on Gaza, and to reach our voices to the United Nations as there are random killings of our people in Palestine. In Beirut, Hezbollah protesters headed for the offices of the UN. They chanted, God bless Gaza. In Tehran, too, there were demonstrations against Israel and the West. We shall only be silent when we're dead. Tell Israel, America and England that we are the nation behind Palestine and its people. Europe is tense. Pro-Palestinian demonstrations have been banned in Berlin and everywhere in France, the authorities fearing violence. Protesters defying the ban in Paris last night were met with tear gas and water cannon. President Macron has appealed to the French people not to let international divisions divide them at home. In Warsaw, people of different faiths gathered to pray for peace. Thank you so much, and I'm the, I would like to say that I'm sorry for what's happening. The prayers were led by Poland's chief rabbi and joined by Christians and Muslims. Oh Allah. This man says, O oh Allah, we condemn all acts of violence and terrorism. We ask for your guidance to lead us to the path of peace. In Beijing today, an Israeli embassy employee was stabbed outside a supermarket. The attack shown in images on social media. The victims in hospital. Police say they've arrested a foreign worker and are investigating his motive. In America, the New York state governor said the city is on high alert. Police and the National Guard stationed at synagogues and Grand Central Station. The city mayor said extra patrols were being deployed in Jewish and Muslim communities. New York City is the most diverse city in the world, and protecting our residents is the most sacred responsibility that we have. We have directed the NYPD to surge additional resources to schools, houses of worship, to ensure that they are safe. In New York, there have been rival demonstrations for Israel and the Palestinians. As tensions mount, countries around the world hold their breath.